um, without any further ado, we'll get underway. So uh, sizing compressed air systems, looking at some in-depth case studies. And so just as a quick uh, overview to get us started this morning, we're going to start out by just talking a little bit about demand versus supply, um, differences between process air and instrument air, um, cover a little bit around equipment sizing in terms of compressors, receivers, dryers, um, filters and pipework, and then uh, go through a number of case studies to highlight uh, the various uh, talking points from today. So, well, to start with, and we keep saying this and we keep saying it for very good reason, um, when it's time to uh, size or, or specify um, the supply side of your system, your plant and equipment, it's assumed, of course, that we've actually got on top of our demand side initiative. So, on top of leaks and inappropriate use, artificial demand, and um, we've got our pressures and everything else under control, our distribution side of the system sorted out. Um, so, until you've done all of that, it's sort of a, really a waste of time looking at the supply because you'll have to redo it after you've looked at the demand. So, just a, can't uh, re-emphasise that point uh, enough. Now. When we start with the demand profile, I guess the question is, is we, we touched on this briefly uh, a couple of weeks ago, but we, well, how do we get this demand profile? Now, for an existing site, we're going to take some measurements. Now, we're going to talk for a few minutes this morning about what sort of shape or form those measurements might take. Now, typically for most people out in the industry, um, there's some sort of measure of the compressor loading. So that might be just amps with a simple CT clamp on a phase on the compressor. Obviously very cheap, easy to do, we don't have to turn anything off. Um, those that are a little bit more sophisticated and want to capture the full story might actually measure the full power consumption. Um, some of you may be fortunate enough to have that sort of instrumentation on your system. Um, pressure. Hopefully most uh, systems out there, if you're looking at, are going to have some sort of logging or monitoring of the pressure on the system. Um, I guess it's fairly easy to screw a pressure um, logger into a system at some point. Now, that's going to tell you some of what's going on, but ultimately when you measure the loading of the compressor or the power even, what that's actually telling you is what the supply to the system is. It doesn't actually tell you what the demand is, it's just going to give you the supply. Now, you can infer a few things, but you need to be very careful, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, now, if we actually measure the flow, depending on where we measure that flow, we could still be primarily measuring supply rather than demand. So we need to be a little bit careful about where we do those measurements. Now, the other side of the coin today that we're going to touch on is with a greenfield site, so you've got a brand new plant that's being built, or it might even apply to uh, what's probably more common in New Zealand is what's referred to as a brownfield site where you've got an existing uh, plant or factory, we might be adding another processing line or, a, or another factory building on the site and sort of dovetailing in or tying into existing services. So it might not be a completely greenfield, brand new installation, but sort of we might be adding new pieces of kit and, and tying that into existing services. Now in both those situations, there's going to be some sort of uh, original equipment manufacturer or supplier, um, possibly a number of uh, project engineers, consulting engineers that will have uh, um, specified will come up with a number by some shape or form as to what the utility demands are going to be. And somewhere buried in those documentation will be some loading or capacity for the compressed air system, a flow, a pressure, um, and, and, and so on. Now, built in over the top of all of that, of course, is going to be a number of anxiety factors, as I like to call them. And this is where people are going to um, make some assumptions, and of course whenever we make assumptions, good engineers generally allow a little bit of leeway um, so that they're not caught short. Um, the danger of course is if we allow too much leeway then we can get ourselves into trouble. Then of course on the other side of that pendulum is you've got some uh, capital project managers somewhere along the line that are trying to rein in the capital budget, and so you might throw in some procurement guys as well. And then, of course, they're going to be watching the dollars and watching the budget. And so there's going to be pressure somewhere in the system to compromise on what we afford, what we pay for as part of the project. And so we've got all of these uh, external forces and pressures. And obviously, um, they need to be managed in a way that we not only 
keep things on time and on budget, but also get the installation that's going to work. And we've actually got a really good case study that we'll share at the end of the presentation today around that. Okay, so if we talk about an existing site, okay, if we measure at the compressor end or the compressor loading, so as you can see the graph there on the left, you can measure how much the compressor is cycling which doesn't necessarily tell you the actual instantaneous demand. What you can infer from that, however, is obviously some sort of average load on the system. Now, if it's fairly even and uniform, then we can infer that uh, um, we may be able to infer what's going on. Now, alternatively, if you look the graph on the right, there is actually a instantaneous total uh, airflow usage for a site over a two and a half week period. You can see obviously, if I get my little highlighter here, um, we've got some weekend periods in here and then you'll also see you've got a night shift coming in all through the week as well where obviously the flow is dropping off. We'll just uh, erase all of those. And so it's very important that we um, understand as we uh, are looking at the demand, that we, uh, we, we truly are measuring what we think we are measuring. And so we've got to differentiate between the supply over here, which is what the compressors will be doing, versus what the plant's actually calling for or using. Now, for a greenfield site, um, you'll have your specifications and then you'll have uh, potentially those might be broken down into individual unit operations or demands. So your plant might be split up into four or five or more um, individual process lines that will have a demand or there will be mul multiple uh, machines that will have individual specified uh, air demands and other utilities. And so then we might aggregate those demands together. Now of course where we have to be a little bit careful here is when we're aggregating those demands we can obviously easily aggregate the averages, but how do we handle the peaks and the troughs in those demands? So you have to be very, very careful, especially if you've got something that's got a very peak, um, very, very peaky or sort of intermittent load. And we'll, we'll talk about some examples uh, today around that and look at how you can do some calculations. Then of course, obviously over the top of all of that, you've got your conservative uh, um, safety margins or anxiety factors that we've already talked about. Um, and then of course at the other end of the spectrum, you know, I've got a competitive tender process going on and so there's going to be pressure on from suppliers. Um, some might be keener than others to get the work. Um, now of course the challenge today, there's certainly been some rather public um, uh, articles in the news recently, not so much around compressors as such but around steel being used on big infrastructure projects in New Zealand, um, you know, and some corners had been cut and what was offered at a cheaper price did actually turn out to be uh, not so uh, not so good in terms of not being up to scratch and so you know at, at the end of the day it's a good timely reminder to uh, acknowledge that just because it's the cheapest offering it may not be the best especially if it's substantially cheaper than some of the other offerings you've got to be very careful and ask and make sure well what's actually going on are you comparing an apple with an apple or is it one an apple and one a banana and of course we all know what happens with banana skins so uh, we do need to be careful now it's superimposed over all of this um, you need to think about acceptable tolerances um, and look at differences between what might be the compressor output versus the net air actually supplied to the system. There could be a number of losses in there, especially around dryers. We're going to talk about that um, today. Now, of course, there will be some other life cycle cost considerations depending on the type of compressor you install. Um, some might have larger capital costs up front, but lower maintenance costs in the long term or a, or a lower, or lower cost or a longer life with uh, smaller, large maintenance items. And so there's pros and cons both ways. Um, we're not going to get into the debate today, but certainly there's plenty to be said around oil-free versus uh, oil-injected screw compressors, for example, depending on applications and, and so forth. Um, and, and certainly depending on the nature of your business and what it is you're using the air for, there's certainly some numbers to be run to sort of uh, 
um, weigh up the pros and cons of going with uh, what's a cheaper capital cost um, with the uh, oil injector screw compressor versus uh, some longer term um, longer term uh, costs for the system as a whole. Okay, and so if we're just looking ahead now, so trying to represent this a bit more clearly for everyone today. So on the left hand side here we have our supply, which is where we're going to measure the compressor coming off and then going through a dryer. Now in this case we've got a dry receiver. We may in some instances have a wet receiver in here between the compressor and the dryer. Then downstream of our main receiver we'll have our distribution system and at this point we might be measuring the actual plant demand. Now if we're measuring post that receiver and if the receiver is a decent size, that measurement will be a reasonable uh, measure of the plant demand. Now the one exception of course could be is there could be a very uh, a cyclic or very peaky load further off into the system that might be uh, not fully represented there so you, sometimes you need to use a little bit of common sense and make sure that you've got all the bases covered. But fundamentally you've got to differentiate between where you're measuring and what information you can derive from those measurements. Now it's, I don't want to say today or have everyone leave today feeling like it's uh, no good to just measure in the compressor house. There's certainly a great deal that can be gleaned from that information. This is really more about a, a buyer beware sort of cautionary note if you will to say be careful and recognise that when you've just measured what the compressor load is, that's not necessarily the full story in terms of the system demand, but it gives you a snapshot of how the system is currently delivering um, the demand that's being asked of it. Okay, so what we're going to do today is to keep things a little bit simple. I've um, I've I've settled on a, a a sort of a single frame size sort of compressor. And this is just sort of to make sort of the uh, various calculations through today uh, a little bit more uh, streamlined. And so what we're going to do is we're going to consider a 250 kilowatt screw compressor. Now this will be standard 7.5 bar gauge discharge pressure. Now I do want to point out here if you uh, pick up one of these units or if you've got one and you actually measure the full loaded power consumption of one of these compressors, yes it'll have a 250 kilowatt motor unless you've uh, been very specific when you purchased it and requested a bigger motor. But if you measure the power consumption you will find at full load most of those compressors will be pulling somewhere between 260 and 270 kilowatts. Now for many of you, you're probably sitting there thinking, well hang on a minute, if it's a 250 kilowatt motor, how can I pull 260, 270 kilowatts through my 250 kilowatt motor? And this is where um, it's, it's a common common uh, trait that's used roost around the world and this is where motors have always got what they refer to as a service factor, i.e. you can run them over and above that nameplate of 250 to a certain degree. And it's only a, a few percentage points if you will. However, what you do want to be aware of is actually, truth be told, the compressor through most of its life is running that motor fairly hard. Now on the uh, industries where this sort of equipment is considered critical. <coughs> what some customers will do is actually specify as part of their tender document that the uh, motors and the compressors cannot exceed the, uh, the nameplate uh, rating and so what compressor companies will typically do is actually provide the next frame size up compressor and derate it with a change in the gearbox so that the uh, motors aren't actually running up into their service factor. So it's actually quite common in the uh, petrochem and, uh, and sort of power heavy infrastructure sectors for this sort of work to be done. Now that aside, we're not going to get into that today, so we're going to, having given you that cautionary note today to be aware that that's what happens. We're going to just simplify things today and just treat it as a 250 kilowatt compressor. Now food full load capacity, now I know this is going to get the uh, the tongues wagging amongst the uh, various suppliers that are listening in today. So I've tried to be a little bit diplomatic today, I'm not going to weigh into a debate about specific power consumption and, and full loaded capacities in terms of airflow outputs and all the rest of it. But for argument's sakes, let's just say that our nominal compressor today has got to have a loaded capacity of 40 to 42 normal cubic metres a minute and a specific power sum consumption somewhere between 6.2 and 6.7 kilowatts per cubic metre a minute. 
Now, obviously, depending on the nature of your machine that you have and the supplier and everything else, there will be a rated capacity or a nameplate for that compressor. Um, and so uh, you, you can look at that yourself. Now, of course, your, your supplier of your compressor, they will have a, uh, a number of standards that they will refer to. Um, I think it's ISO 1217, and the compressor guys will be able to correct me online if, if I've not got that right, which stipulates uh, these various standards that, that govern how the capacities of compressors are measured and rated and so forth. Um, so nonetheless, these compressors will be rated. Now, for the purposes of today's discussion, we'll just keep it simple, okay? But as we said, uh, just to reiterate there, and it's, it's there in the next bullet point, the numbers will vary for your particular compressor depending on the style, the make, the model, the uh, motor control, the number of stages, etc. Um, might be variable speed, could be a fixed speed, could be a variable uh, volume, um, could be a variable discharge, a variable inlet, um, a number of various combinations and permutations that uh, are available to the market. Now, the key thing to point out here, which is far more significant, and we're going to talk about this today, is the performance of these, in, these uh, units are going to be much more heavily impacted by ambient inlet conditions, which we discussed a couple of weeks ago, but we're going to retouch on today, and specifically we're talking pressure, temperature, and humidity. Okay, so... What we're going to do is if we take first of all our 250 kilowatt screw compressor, it could be in a load and unloaded application. So at 42 cubic metres a minute, we're going to times that by 60 and we get 25, 20 cubic metres an hour. So for the, uh, um, for, the, for the basis for today's discussions, what we're going to say is that's effectively 2,500 cubic metres an hour when it's loaded. And if it's unloaded, it's going to be zero. Now, if it's a variable speed, or say a variable capacity application, then we're typically going to have a 30 to 100% sort of turn down capability on that compressor, which if we translate it into flow is going to be 750 to 2500 cubic metres an hour. Now, I just would like to remind ourselves that, that these numbers are just arbitrary for the purposes of today's discussion and obviously will vary a little depending on your make and model. Now, if you've got a multiple machine application, which we come across a fair bit here in New Zealand, we might have two identical machines. So let's say we've got two 250 kilowatt compressors. There's a number of sites that I could rattle off um, that have this sort of situation. There's a, in fact, there's a couple that have sort of half a dozen to eight or more of these machines. Um, now, of course, if we have two variable capacity machines like this, is our joint capacity or envelope 1,500 to 5,000? And if so, how are they controlled? Now, typically what ends up happening in the real world is one of those compressors will base load and then the other one will trim. So meaning one's going to be fully loaded and the other one's trimming. Now, you can get some smart uh, third-party controllers that will be quite effective, but generally your base level installation out there doesn't uh, um, offer that sort of functionality. And so what does that then mean? Well, if we have one variable machine, we can go from 750 to 2500 cubic metres an hour. Now, if we have two variable machines, but one base and one trim, what you really end up with is a 2500, i.e. the machine loaded, plus the second one trimming, which means that you've got a bit of a gap between the 2500 of one machine running and the 3250 of the two running up to 5,000. So what happens is this, what I refer to as a supply envelope gap between our 2500 and 3250. And so we need to be very careful when we start to size compressors in this sort of situation, because you've got to appreciate that our demand might actually sit in there, which might then mean our control system's gonna really struggle. And so this is where you need to be careful about not just looking at what we need in terms of total capacity, but how is my equipment selection going to deliver on the range that's going to be demanded of it? Because typically the uh, demand is not going to be a constant flat number, it will vary and go up and down. And so what we need to think about as part of our solution here is we might need to use multiple machines, but they may not be the same size. 
Now, for people with a maintenance hat on, you think, oh, it's a lot more convenient to have machines all identical, the same size. Um, we can rotate them through from a run hours point of view, but you can end up paying dearly in terms of energy, efficiency, and importantly, stability of the system. So as I referred to a few minutes ago, I, one of the options is you can look at um, some custom sort of uh, third-party smart controllers or possibly look at a single bigger variable machine to meet your demand. And we'll actually have some specific plant data that we'll share later today and talk through these scenarios. Now, just before we do that, just trying to really set the scene here. So once again, we have um, this, this whole differentiation between air, where it might be used for process versus instrument. Now, quick recap here, all air has some moisture in it. Um, it's not completely dry, even though, as you'll know, there's a lot of specification sheets out there that specify dry air, which is a bit of a misnomer, which is why whenever we're specifying or sizing a compressor, we need to compensate. Now, when compressed air um, is, well, when air is compressed, um, it typically is going to become saturated. Now, most compressors fitted with after coolers, um, and the reason for that is they obviously want to cool the air down. The air being saturated, we're going to actually very effectively remove a big chunk of that water. And so that water is actually in liquid form. Now, for an oil-free compressor, that's just a simple matter of a, excuse me, a drain on the system, preferably a wet receiver. It gives somewhere for the water to collect. Now, on an oil-injected system, of course, you're going to have to have a water-oil separator. And, of course, sizing those separator vessels becomes very important because, obviously, the humidity that your compressor sees is going to determine the volume of water, and your separator vessel needs to be sized to handle that volume of water. Now, obviously, wet receivers, as I've mentioned, are quite useful. Now, process air is air where we're actually reasonably relaxed. We might obviously drain off the, uh, the excess water in the uh, after cooler, but then after that, we're not too worried about the uh, air being saturated. Um, the air is just being blown into, uh, into uh, sort of depending on the nature of the product we're making. It might not matter that a bit of the air goes in there whether it's got a bit of water or not. So, for example, uh, uh, the big pulp mills, the paper mills and the like, they use a fair amount of uh, process air, like the steel mill and, and other big processes that uh, the air is used for um, well, non sort of hygienic purposes. There's no need to spend the money to uh, treat and, and further dry the air. Now, of course, there are some consequences of having wet air that's saturated. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, in comparison, instrument air is air that we're going to dry to remove not just the uh, water that's condensed out, but actually have it even drier because we don't want to have any more of that water condense out further downstream. Certainly, things cool down um, as air expands. Um, we don't want to damage our pneumatic tools, our valves. Um, also, if you're in the food industry, of course, you can get various biofilms and all sorts of uh, very bug-friendly environs if we have moisture sitting in lines where we don't want it to. So obviously, it can lead to all sorts of food contamination problems and, and so forth. So this is why most food manufacturing facilities will have a compressed air requirement for uh, uh, desiccant dried uh, air. Minus sort of 26, 28 degrees seems to be the magic number for sort of killing a lot of bugs. Um, and generally, you'll find uh, you know pharmaceutical grade requirements are sort of minus minus 40 or below in terms of dew point. Now, um, obviously, if we've got wet process air, we can save a heap of money in terms of initial capital, and then also the running cost of the dryers. However, what we need to be mindful of is there's plenty of sites that I've certainly been to over the years where our process air lines are sort of rusting away from the inside out. There's plenty of contamination in the lines, and obviously once it's in there, it's very difficult to get it out. Um, and so initially, you might save on your equipment in the plant room, but your pipe work, which uh, doesn't tend to get replaced when you replace your compressor, unfortunately, is going to degrade over time. And obviously, being a, a pressurized pipe network, at some point, that's going to become a safety hazard. Um, so plant maintenance challenges and potentially some product quality implications. You don't want scale from your compressed air line coming out perhaps into your product. Um, it might contaminate your product stream. So there are some, some challenges with uh, having a sort of a lazy wet process air stream. Now, 
the counter to that, of course, is okay, so we decide we don't want the water. So then, of course, the immediate question is, well, how dry is dry? You know, or, or, how, or what's dry enough? So what sort of dew point do we need? Now, the simplest thing to look at is, okay, we don't want to have any water condense in our line. So the logical thing is to say, well, what's our lowest air temperature? And we need a dew point below that, because obviously if our dew point's below that, then we won't ever have any water condense out in our line. Now what you need to be careful of, of course, is this a wind chill effect. Um, so you, you might actually have an ambient air temperature of uh, sort of two degrees, or um, certainly in New Zealand there are times where we get below zero in a lot of places, and so a refrigerant dryer, which can only deliver a dew point of two to four degrees, is not always going to have a dry airline. Now, of course, even if you were sort of further up north where you don't have too many frosts, you might think you get away with it, but then when you get a cold southerly blowing, you might still have those wind chill effects. So we want to avoid condensing water in our airlines, and so we want to have a dew point that's low enough that will help protect our equipment. Now, just to recap very quickly today in terms of different drying technology and options available to us. Probably the most prevalent dryer, um, certainly because it's, it, it's cheap and easy to install, great little standalone units, is the old faithful refrigerant dryer. Now, uh, what's really good about the refrigerant dryer is there's no air loss. Um, it's obviously compressed air is expensive. We don't want to be wasting it. Um, they can get a, a, a relatively high dew point compared to desiccant dryers, but we still get to sort of two, um, four degrees definitely, maybe two where everything is lined up. Um, you've got very little in the way of filter requirements. Um, it's, it's just a straight in and out uh, heat exchanger effectively. And the good thing about the refrigerant dryer is effectively you come out of the after cooler, then you uh, are cooling the air down, and then you heat the air back up again. And what's good about that is you can use the air going out to cool down the air coming in, so it's sort of direct air-to-air -air heat exchange, and so the refrigeration cycle can be fairly modest in relation to the total load that is on the system. Um, now, obviously, if we need a better dew point than that, then we're stuck with sort of having to use some sort of desiccant dryer. Now, we can get really good uh, um, low dew points with this, minus 40, very easily achievable, and minus 60, minus 70, uh, readily available as well. Now, the challenge, of course, with the desiccant dryers is they all need to be regenerated. And what we mean by that is the desiccant, which is normally either a silica gel or a, um, a, a alumina type uh, absorbent material, um, it will absorb the water, but then you've got to dry or purge that water from the desiccant so you can then reuse it. Now, what is good is the desiccant does tend to uh, be quite happy to absorb water and then, then have it dried off it and, and repeat the cycle quite nicely. Um, however, to do that, we either need to put a whole heap of dry air through the desiccant to regenerate it, or we can use some sort of heated air stream, which might just blow ambient air that's been heated through the desiccant to dr remove the water. And so what we typically do is we'll have a twin tower. One tower will be drying the air and the other one will be regenerating. Now, we can use external heaters. You can also use sort of an external heater. You might have access to cheap steam on your site. Some parts of the country might have cheap geothermal steam, for example. Um, and so there's a number of options in terms of controls and, and how you can do it. Now, obviously, the critical thing with all these things, as with any drying process, maintaining process temperatures becomes quite important. So whatever you put in place to regenerate your dryer needs to be uh, very stable, in control, and be able to handle temperatures or keeping temperatures within very tight margins so that you preserve the, the quality and life of the desiccant. Um, so here's a picture of our desiccant dryer. So we'll have a pre-filter at the front end because um, we don't want to contaminate our desiccant and, and be, have any detrimental impacts on its ability to absorb moisture. Okay, so you'll then have your two towels left and right and one will be the duty and then the other one will be in a regeneration mode and then they will switch. Um, then post the dry, you'll have another after filter and this is to remove any fines in terms of off the desiccant, any fine powder and the like. 
Um, and obviously, cautionary note here, if you have a desiccant uh, dryer that you're using with an oil injected screw compressor, very, very important that you have your oil water separation working well and that you get minimal oil carryover into your desiccant because any oil in the desiccant will contaminate and then it will be a very expensive exercise to replace the desiccant. So very, very important. Not that they can't be used, but you just need to be very, very careful. And generally with a desiccant system, you've got a lot more filters to protect from that sort of eventuality. Now, so if we look once again at our, our, our straw man, which is our 250 kilowatt compressor, if we assume that all of that air is instrument air and is needing to be dried, if we have a stock standard off-the-shelf air purge desiccant tower, so twin towers, our air purges typically, depending on your manufacturer, um, I'll get the disclaimer out there now before the various suppliers on the call today might uh, uh, try and get their uh, edge in and that uh, their dryer is a little better, that, that will range depending on your, your make, model and supplier. Um, but we'll, for the argument for today, we'll use an 18% of your airflow as your purge. And so what this does is it takes dry air from your active tower, and about 18%, could be a little less, could be a little more, um, and then uses that as the purge air stream to blow the moisture out effectively of the uh, tower being regenerated. Now, so what that translates to, if I've got a 250 kilowatt compressor, that translates to 45 kilowatts of that compressor just running the dryer. So if our power's 10 cents a kilowatt, that's four bucks 50 an hour, or just under $40,000 a year. So the other thing you've got to add on top of that is you've got the cost of maintenance of the filters and the desiccant, keeping that all right, and everything else. So you can see that the cost of actually having that dry compressed air, if we use a stock standard air purge, can get very expensive. Now, the alternative is we might be able to do what's called, so the same tower, but we might be able to fit that with dew point dependent switching. So what that means is a typical standard dryer is going to switch on a timer base, but what we might do is we might actually put a dew point meter in the line and actually measure the dew point and only switch the dryer once we're at our maximum dew point. Now, of course, what we can do is this only works if when you regenerate the tower, you actually stop purging air through it. We've seen plenty of these systems set up where you change the timing, but you don't change the, uh, the uh, purge cycle on the tower. So it becomes very important that you get this all right, of course. And depending on who you talk to and what the ambient uh, inlet conditions are, um, you know, that number may go up or down. But for argument's sake, for a typical installation in New Zealand, we'll use as a, an approximation for today's exercise at 9%. Now, depending on which part of the country and just how bad a year you've got in terms of humidity, Incidentally, the last uh, January through to April was very, very humid in New Zealand compared to the last few years. So obviously this year wouldn't have been a good year to run these numbers and it will vary from year to year. Um, but for, for the purposes of today's exercise, if we take it at 9% on average, that represents sort of a 50% cost reduction. So you're just a tick under 20,000 per annum in operational costs. Now, as we just said there, just to reiterate, it will vary depending on your actual ambient conditions and how that averages out through the year. Now, the alternative to these two options is you can use some sort of other external heating source. So there are some on the market that will have an electric heater inside the tower, um, and they typically will blow ambient air through, the air gets heated, and then obviously uh, regenerates the desiccant. You could also use steam heaters to do the same thing, but all of them, various shapes and forms, all rely on blowing a, a source of external ambient air that's heated to be able to regenerate. Now, depending on your utility costs and what you do, you can have sort of ten to twenty thousand dollars per annum, depending on what sort of model you use and what you have to pay for. So you can see that at many points, it could be just as expensive as a dew point dependent switching uh, option using compressed air anyway. So really does depend in terms of doing your homework, in terms of what you've got available, in terms of uh, what your power price is versus what, say, for example, your steam prices and figuring out what's going to be most effective for you to maintain and to service. 
Okay, so if we go as another option, is we could actually use the heat generated, if you've got an oil-free uh, compressor that'll typically be a two-stage, the air between the stages actually goes through an intercooler. The reason for that, of course, is as you compress air, it heats up, and obviously as you heat it up, it gets less efficient to compress. And so what we do is we'll typically take it out of the two, in between the two stages, and we'll cool it back down. Now, one of the things you can do is before that's cooled down, we can use that as our heat source, to regenerate our dryer. And so this is what we refer to as heater compression regeneration. And, and there's a number of uh, options on the market that do this. Um, and it's viewed as, if you like, a free heat source. Now, there are some costs of, of running this system with a few fans and blowers and the like and motors. Typically, these desiccant uh, dryers have some sort of desiccant wheel as opposed to just a, a, a desiccant field tower. Um, but you say operational costs, when you add all these things up, typically will be under $2,000, depending on the specific makeup of the system, could be quite a bit cheaper. Um, so you can see heater compression is certainly quite cost effective. Um, the one thing you do have to be very careful about with this, of course, though, is when your compressor is lightly loaded, or the, the load on the compressor is changing, you can come a little bit unstuck with uh, variability to the process. So, so they do prefer to be well loaded, so you do have to be a little bit careful if you've got a highly variable load. Now, the uh, cheaper option, as we mentioned earlier, is the refrigerant dryer. Obviously, it's going to deliver you a higher dew point. We're going to have lower capital and maintenance costs. We've got an electrical cost of running the refrigeration compressor and a bit of cooling load. Um, generally, there's pretty good heat integration, as I've already mentioned, and so you might get a system running for sort of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per annum, depending on your specific energy costs. Um, of course, you'll have less filters compared to the desiccant dryers, so it can work out marginally cheaper. However, of course, you don't have the same dew point. So, if you don't need the dew point, obviously the refrigerator dryer is sort of probably easier to maintain, a little bit cheaper. Um, not quite the same degree of drying, but if you can get away with it, then that's possibly a, a fairly useful compromise. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, the other thing that we need to be mindful of um, is that uh, we, we then have receivers. Now, as we mentioned earlier, obviously when the air comes out of the air compressor after it's been through the after cooler, typically we like to cool the air down again after that final stage of compression. And when we do that, as we cool it down, the air is going to become saturated, and so water is going to condense out. So it's really useful before our dryer to have that water have somewhere to collect, and so this is where wet receivers can be very useful. Of course, you need to make sure that the drains on these receivers work. I've uh, been at a site a number of years ago where it was a 10 cubic metre receiver, and it was three quarters filled with water because the drain had failed and blocked. Um, it took quite some time to drain the tank and it was amazing the difference to the system once that tank was drained of the water that was bogging it all up. Um, so yes, it would be very, very important. Obviously, you want that water to be drained away, obviously without leaking air. Um, and of course, we want that water out for no other reason, aside from everything else, any water in our system is going to degrade our pressure vessel and remembering that our our pipe work, and in particular our receivers are pressure vessels, they will need to be surveyed each year and thickness tested and corrosion uh, checked and so forth. And so it's very important if you've got water collecting that we keep that water out so we can keep them relatively dry. Um, now of course the good thing about these wet receivers, they can be relatively modest in size, it's not um, there to handle the variable load of the plant, it's just there purely to give the water somewhere to drop out. So therefore, obviously, a, a wet receiver, you want the pipe work going through it, not um, on a branch line, and you want the pipe work coming in such that the water and the air can separate. Um, so typically, you'll have your water coming off the bottom and the air going out the top and your, your intake somewhere on the side of the vessel. Now, on a dry receiver, which is typically after your dryer, if you have one, um, is going to be your primary storage for your system, and that's there to moderate any large swings in system demand. So really what it's there to do is reduce the dynamic pressure range on your system. Now, we're going to talk a little bit further about this today, is, which is always the question, how big does this receiver need to be? Now, the other side of this equation, of course, is something that we're very big on advocating, is the use of point-of-use receivers. 
So this is where if you've got a high local demand, actually having a receiver right there where the demand is, so we can reduce the distribution pressure losses when those peak loads arrive. So just on that, if we look at um, our receivers, you've got to be careful about uh, maintenance costs in terms of them needing to be surveyed. Typically, if they're under a cubic metre, they don't have to be surveyed. Um, I know there are a lot of sites that actually, instead of having a, a, a receiver as such, they just really oversize their pipe work. I'm, I'm aware of one particular site many, many years ago, instead of putting a three inch line in, put an eight inch um, ring main in. And the rationale behind that was as they did that instead of a receiver because their pipe work wasn't surveyable, yet a, a receiver would have been. Um, so yeah, it was sort of a novel approach. And I guess the upshot of that is moving forward many years later as the plant's grown and the demand has grown, the, re the pipe works become less and less of a receiver and more and more of a pipe. And obviously they've had to install supplementary uh, storage to the system, which is still a cost effective solution. So some of you, um, the key things to think about are where are your other peak load points in the system? Do we need to locate some receivers there? Um, you might have some receivers, there's a number of sites we've been to over the years where there's plenty of receivers that have just been installed in the wrong spot. And so it's a matter of moving them and repiping them. Now and this is a really useful but often forgotten about point. If you're going to put a receiver in, it is far more effective to pipe through rather than have the receiver on a branch line. Now, um, I guess I'll, I'll throw that out there for you to uh, see if anyone can uh, suggest why, but um, suffice it to say, if you have it on a branch line, it's very easy for the line in and out of the receiver to actually end up bouncing backwards and forwards in, uh, in terms of as pressures go up and down, the flow doesn't actually come out of the receiver, it more becomes a bit of a, a spring that just spins its wheels. So by having your pipe plumb through the compressor, it then actually becomes more like a, a capacitor in the system as opposed to a spring out on the uh, out on a on a dead limb, if you like. So as far as sizing goes, just to start off with today, we'll get this out there in the open. As the old rules of thumb go, if you look at the various um, uh, compressed air uh, toolbox sites on the web and the like, you'll find that the general rule of thumb for sizing a receiver is that you have one gallon per actual CFM, meaning for every actual um, cubic foot per minute of air that the compressor takes in, you have one gallon of receiver. Now this is your receiver at your compressor. Now translation into metric terms, that's eight litres per litres per second. Um, now the other way that they do it is you can, the same numbers if you're working out a different way is four gallons per horsepower or basically 20 litres per kilowatt. So if you've got a 20 kilowatt compressor, will be 22 kilowatt rather than a 20 obviously, you would then need to have a 440 litre or half cubic metre receiver would be sort of the minimum size you're looking for. Now for a standard installation that's probably okay. But my caution here is, is there's been no consideration as to what your demand profile is like. And so big caution at this point, it's a great starting point, but this is where we want you to think about, well, there's a couple of quick sums that we probably want to do. And this is where when we start basing our size of our receiver on our demand, the first question you've got to ask yourself is what's the pressure range? And if you go to your pressure range, we're going to have one bar. Um, and if we want one bar pressure range, our effective volume is one cubic metre, then our effective volume of air we can supply is one cubic metre. So if we've got 100 cubic metres an hour and we only want a pressure drop of one bar as a peak load, then a cubic metre receiver is going to give us one divided by 100 times 3600 seconds to an hour, gives us 36 seconds of effective storage. Multiply that up. Five cubic metres will give us three minutes, 10 cubic metres will give us six minutes. So depending on the nature of your peak as to what you really need. Now if you have a peak load of 500, obviously the same, same calculation applies. Obviously we've just uh, cut it by a fifth. So our, our one cubic metre now only gives us 7.2 seconds, 36 seconds and 72 seconds respectively. So if the receiver volume isn't enough, if you skimp on the receiver, they can get a little expensive, especially here in New Zealand. What will ultimately happen is your pressure drop will get a lot higher. So when it comes to pipe work and filters, really good rule of thumb. Um, I'll probably upset a few people today and I make no apologies for this. 
Um, whatever size outlets on your compressor or your filter or your dryer, general rule of thumb is make your pipe work at least the next size larger. Why? Because everything's built and designed on a budget, so they go with the smallest possible size, and generally that's not less or certainly less than ideal. Um, applies to filters as well. Why? It's all about velocity. Um, you really must have distribution velocities under 20 metres a second. You need to have velocities under 15, which is good. Uh, preferred under 10 and ideally, or best, okay, is closer to 5 metres a second. So good, better, best principles apply. And so what we're going to do is if we come back to our compressor, our 250 kilowatt compressor, 6.5 bar gauge, okay, our flow at 2500 becomes 333 actual cubic metres of air in the pipe. Okay, we convert that to a cubic metres a second. Then we can consider some options. If we want five metres a second, it means that line needs to be at least 153 millimetres in diameter, i.e. a six inch line. 10 metres a second, it's 108. 15 is 89. And 20 metres a second is 76. So conclusion, a four inch line on that compressor is marginal. A three inch line is actually unacceptable. And ideally, you really want to be going for six inch if you can. It's really that simple. Remember, pressure drop is proportional to the square of velocity. Okay, so some case studies to round all this up today. Okay, so here's our large manufacturing plant that we shared a couple of weeks ago, but we've spelt out now that we've got four 250 kilowatt screw compressors, which is very convenient for the size machine we use today, and all our numbers, all running load unload, otherwise known as our poor man's VSD. Okay, old site, redundant lines, high leak rates, high peak loads. Okay, and so you can see this, our peak loads, bring it into our cumulative percentage, this our production, this is all offline, this is all leaks and a little bit of maintenance. But let's put on our compressors. And so what do we learn from this? This is one compressor, two fully running, three fully running, four fully running. What do we learn from this? Well, for 40% of the time we, we use less than or equal to one compressor. 70% of the time we get by with two, 95% of the time we've got three, and the fourth one's never actually fully loaded. The other thing that's interesting is 60% of the first compressor, i.e. 150 kilowatts, is just leaks. Well, it's 105,000 per annum at 10 cents a kilowatt. 20 kilowatts of unloaded running, well, that's 17 and a half kilowatts. Okay, fixing leaks would free up the fourth compressor as a spare. Considering the maintenance cost of these compressors long term, you really want to be doing this with a lot less compressors and having the right size sort of unit. Um, obviously fixing the leaks and doing a whole heap of other things would also be very smart. But you can see that when you start to look at what your demand profile is, having a whole heap of right size or same size machines is not necessarily the best solution. Now here's a bag cow, so I want to take a couple of minutes on this one. And uh, you'll see that we've got a very high peak load. We can actually bring it into our computer accumulative plot. And it's this top end here where we've probably not quite got enough storage. Now, what do we really learn from this? Well, there was a high peak load of 150 to 200 cubic meters. So if we go back, you can see that our baseline is sort of 100, 150 and we've got 150 to 200 up to our highest peak, but by and large, most of those peaks are relatively modest. Now, what you can see is that that's not occurring all that often, whereas our average is well below 100. And so what we're saying is we've got these short duration peaks. Now, if we can tolerate a one bar drop, okay, and we need to supply an extra 200 cubic meters an hour, a one cubic meter receiver is going to deliver an 18 second 200 cubic meter an hour peak without any trouble. So we probably, to be fair, we want to probably have that close to a minute, even though it was sort of a little less, we want to give ourselves a little, little leeway. And so what we would do in this situation is we'd turn around and say, look, we'd put a three cubic meter receiver up there. Um, next to there, we'd make sure that pipe work was piping through the receiver, that the receiver wasn't on a branch line. The other thing we might look to do is uh, use a low pressure shutoff. So if something blows downstream on the bag house, it doesn't drain our whole system, we'll have a low pressure cutoff so that we uh, minimize losses through the bag house. 
Now we could then have an alarm that something could then be fixed. Now what does this actually translate to? Well that's the difference between using an 11, maybe 15 kilowatt compressor versus having a 37 kilowatt compressor that's barely loaded 30% on average um, around the clock. So really, really smart use of a receiver, you can make quite a big difference to actually the load on your system. So here's another intermittent demand. You'll see that you've got a fairly steady demand between 500 and 1,000 cubic metres an hour. And then we have this change in demand here, which actually, um, I'll confess at this point, was actually a cleaning duty, which really should have been eliminated. But let's say this was a real demand. You'll notice if we go back that uh, there were some sustained peaks. It wasn't just a brief blip. It lasted for a little while. Not for very long, but enough where we're probably not going to be able to deliver um, the air from just a receiver. So you've got 1,500 cubic metres an hour, um, intermittent, but sort of sustained for five or ten minutes. Now, you're not going to deal with that with just a receiver. Now, of course, the immediate thing to do, and like I've just uh, confessed in this particular application, that load was someone turning on an air lance and blowing uh, debris around as a way of cleaning up. Not the smartest use of compressed air and to be fair, best to be done some other way, either sucking things up or, or with a blower rather than compressed air. Now, assuming that was a genuine demand, let's say it might have a process that did require it, if you couldn't substitute or replace it, then you'd need to look at, well, how do we use a single machine to do this? It's going to be right to the upper limit of, say, a 250 kilowatt machine, but if we went that way, on average, we're going to be only loaded at 30%, which is right on the minimum cusp of what a VSD compressor is going to be able to do. So we're going to have a real challenge, um, especially if this air is being dried, because these uh, dryers fitted to machines like that don't like being partially loaded. So that peak actually represents 150 kilowatts of compressor capacity. So the short duration peak, it might be okay to have a machine that loads and unloads to provide that load. Um, so you want to be very, very careful and figure out that for if we go back for 5% of the time, you can see here it's not that much versus 95% of the time, we don't want our 5% solution to ruin the efficiency of our system, the other 95. You, if you really do need it, then you want to make sure that 95% of the time you're super efficient and the other 5% you really can afford to just get by. So another example here is our total system. This is just a, a, a fairly steady demand, but you'll notice that there's lots of short little peaks in demand. Now what's interesting, of course, is when we split this out, you'll see that we've got a fairly steady variable demand. A little bit of a peak, a little bit of a trough indicates that we could possibly use a bit more storage. So what would we do in this instance? Well, our demand profile is really from 1,000 to 3,500 but in reality sort of from 1500 to about 2700 if we knocked off those peaks and troughs. Each of those peaks and troughs were less than two minutes. So in this sort of scenario, it's certainly a prime candidate for a large receiver rather than having a couple of big um, multiple compressors, especially then most of the time it's gonna be hard to control. Now if we go for our one bar drop, at 1500 cubic meters an hour. If we have a 10 cubic meter receiver, that gives us 24 seconds. 20 cubic meters is gonna give us 48 seconds. And a 25 cubic meter receiver is gonna give us sort of 60 seconds. So given the sort of the nature of the system, yes, a receiver that size is gonna be fairly expensive, but fairly cost effective compared to having an extra big compressor hanging around just for those intermittent peaks. So a 20 to 25 cubic meter receiver is probably going to be the order of the day and then you're probably looking at a decent large single variable capacity machine and based on that I'd probably be looking at a 315 kilowatt because um, a 250 is not going to be big enough. You might even go the next frame size up but then what you have to be careful is whether you've now not got the minimum load on the system. So. We're going to finish off today with one final case study, which is um, worth, worth talking about, and this is the brand new installation. So the specification was for 450 normal cubic metres an hour of oil-free instrument air, food grade quality, meaning it was obviously 
product contact or food contact needed a 40 degree or minus 40 degree dew point, so obviously desiccant dried air, and it was sort of coastal New Zealand climate. Now, the selected solution was a single 55 kilowatt oil-free screw compressor with a twin tower air purge desiccant dryer fitted with a one and a half cubic meter receiver. Now, one and a half cubic meters is probably quite generous in terms of our 55 kilowatts. If we times that by 20, we get sort of 1,100 litres, so 1,500 litres or one and a half cubic metres is probably fairly generous. However, they made what's probably a glaringly uh, uh, silly assumption, and that is, is that free air delivery is about the same as normal cubic metres an hour, and so they supplied the compressor that could do that. However, the outcome of all of that was there was insufficient capacity in the system, couldn't sustain the pressure, and so Obviously, the system struggled and uh, it became a bit of an argument as to what to do. So what we want to do is, well, today, let's just pause for a minute and look at why and what should have been selected. So if FAD is actually 20 degrees, 65% RH, how much do we have to derate the compressor? Now, these are numbers that we went through a couple of weeks ago, but just trying to give you some context here. If that is the case, on a temperature, we have to derate the compressor by 6.8%, that's the straight temperature ratio. Then you've got your partial pressure ratio as a function of your relative humidity, and that gives you another 1.5% derating. And so your combined overall rating is 8.2%. Uh, now, of course, there's some additional challenges because that wasn't as clear cut. Um, obviously, in New Zealand, summer comes around, and as I mentioned, the summer just gone was one of the most humid we've had in a while, so the humidity increased. Then, of course, the other complication was the inlet to the compressor wasn't ducted, so it was sucking air from inside the hot, closed plant room. And, of course, that plant room was the same plant room where the uh, dry was discharging its hot air, obviously laden with water that's been... Uh, sucked in and, and just sort of regenerated in the room. And so obviously you've got an elevated ambient temperature in the plant room above the outside ambient plus an elevated humidity. Throw in a few steam leaks and a few other things and obviously humidity can get out of hand. So the outcome was our actual compressor inlet was not 20 and 65%, it was 40 and 75 or closer to it. So of course when you rework the scenario, which we did a couple of weeks ago, um, so you can refer back to the previous webinar in terms of going through these numbers, but the short answer is with temperature, we need to derate by 12.8%, so it's nearly double the derating, and relative humidity, we now have to derate by another 5.5%, so that's quite a step up, so a combined derating of 17.6%, getting very close to a 20% reduction in actual capacity of that compressor. Now, admittedly, that's a worst case scenario, but then, of course, we haven't talked yet about, well, where's the purge air for the dryer come from? Now, of course, the original system as proposed and installed was a, a basic, uh, um, fairly cheap uh, standard purge air cycle system. So 18% of the compressor outlet was going in purge air, so never actually getting into the factory. So Obviously, there was another effective derating to the size of the compressor as a result of losing that 18% purge air. Now, we could use a dew point dependent switching to reduce that purge air, but obviously with the ambient conditions the way they were, that was probably not going to save us that much. Remembering, of course, that the rated capacities of dryers is a function of ambient temperature, relative humidity, the discharge temperature of the compressor, or after cooler actually, and of course the pressure of the system. So when you need the dryer most, the dryer capacity is actually at its smallest. And so the, the key take home message today with this is obviously be very, very careful with following the guidelines of the manufacturers of dryers to make sure that you are sizing it correctly, not just for your standard condition, but your worst case scenario condition. Now you've got other issues, specified flow is based on um, the average use, not the peak demand. So, you know, was there an allowance made for leaks? So a number of things meant that the compressor was short. So, okay, we've talked about everything that was wrong, how would we actually correct that? Well, first things first, obviously we add 10% to compensate for the ambient conditions, 
And just a little side note, in case you hadn't got that message today, just a reminder for ourselves that free air delivery is not the same as normal cubic metres. We need to derate the compressor accordingly. Now the ducted intake for the air compressor should have been from outside the plant room, so it doesn't mean we need to derate the compressor further, we just need to install the compressor effectively. Now the dryer obviously allow for purge air or use alternative regeneration, so heater compression, etc. Um, verify peak loads as well as average system demands, and we probably would have looked a little closer at the sizing of receivers, receivers sorry, um, in terms of peak loads and so forth. Um, it's generally a good marginal payback for having a slightly bigger receiver if you put it in the right spot. Okay, so that, that brings us at sort of a bit of a whirlwind through a number of different scenarios where we can sort of apply the various aspects of how we size a compressor. Um, certainly happy for you to fire questions at me or contact me post off, offline, post the webinar if you wish. But just to summarise today, um, compressor performance is adversely affected by temperature, humidity, inlet pressure losses and altitude. Just in case, just to reiterate once again, free air delivery is not the same as normal flow rate. You need to ensure that ambient conditions are accounted for when sizing any new compressors, including altitude, um, temperature, humidity. Make allowances for water removal, especially worst case scenarios when we have a hot summer and, and humid day. Um, obviously we need to make sure that our supply envelope incorporates not just our average demand but our peaks. Use receivers carefully to manage those peaks and obviously in all of that we've got to understand our system control options so that we can uh, have a positive impact on our efficiency. So that concludes our webinar today. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, there's been a few comments uh, made as we've gone through today. I appreciate the comments from you guys from the industry. Um, but just as a note, while I've given you guys a chance to write in any questions that you might have, um, future webinars coming up, the next one in a fortnight will be with Dr. Martin Atkins on flow controller pump systems. Then we have a fan system duct design and system troubleshooting with me. Um, later on in August and then early in September we'll be looking at water hammer in steam and condensate systems. It's a topic that keeps coming up over and over again. Okay. Uh, Campbell, I'll see. Um, Campbell, are you mic'd up? You there, you there, Campbell? Uh, yep. Yeah. So you you posed the question in talking earlier about having receivers in series instead of parallel. I don't know that I quite meant it like that. I was tr I'm just trying to rack my brain as to which slide we're talking about. Oh, so it was um, why would you have the ear going through the receiver instead of having that off on a branch line? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, well, certainly for a uh, wet receiver that's very useful. Obviously, you want the water going, but even a dry receiver, if you have yeah, the pipe, sorry, it was in relation to point of use as well. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No. No. That's okay. Um, yeah. So point of use receiver, um, especially uh, receivers and ring mains and the like. If you pipe the air through the receiver, then the receiver actually acts like a balloon in the line. If it's on a side branch line then that line is both in and out of the receiver. So when you are charging the, uh, the compressor, when you're charging the receiver, okay, if it's on a branch line, obviously air's going into the receiver. If you then discharge from the receiver, air's got to actually turn around direction and fire back the other way. So you can have what might be termed positive or negative flow. Whereas when your receiver, because of course all your receiver is is a big storage locally that absorbs your or reduces the actual pressure fluctuation. If the flow is through the receiver, then that's just like a balloon in the line that's just expanding and contracting. Whereas if it's on a side branch, it might not be able to expand or contract because it's going to be throttled by the throat going in and out. So the beauty of it going through is the air is not having to change direction. Whereas if it's on a branch line, the air is actually having to change direction. And when you look at the velocities um, that the air goes down these lines, 
um, at, you know, 20, 30 metres a second of peak load. I mean, you've got air going 100 kilometres an hour and then you're going to turn it around and send it back the other way at 100 kilometres an hour. Well, nothing actually just turns on a dime and does that. So yeah, that, that's, that's really the rationale for it is you get far more effective use of your receiver if it's piped through rather than off on a branch. Now your really extreme cases are of course where you see a massive five cubic metre receiver with a one inch line going in into it and that's a branch line. You know, so you, you, you've, you've virtually zeroed out the effective use of that volume because you just can't get the air in and out fast enough for the, for the volume fare to respond. So yeah, do, does that sort of elaborate and answer the question? I'm sure you oh, already... No, I was aware of the answer. Yeah. I was just, uh, just pointing out that uh, in case there's people out there... That, no, no, uh, appreciate it. No, no, very well done. Yep. I, I mean, I, I like to deliberately leave some of these things there to try and uh, check to see that you guys are listening. So no, that's great. Thank you for bringing it up. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, thanks very much, Campbell. We'll uh, talk to you again soon. No worries. Cheers. Um, so yeah, so we'll stay online for a few more minutes if anyone else has got any other questions. Um, but yeah, other than that, well, just a reminder that the webinar has been recorded today. Um, by all means, feel free to fire through uh, any questions to me via email at uh, jamesn at Waikato. Obviously, you've got the email address. It's where the invite came from. Um, and just a reminder, just as you're uh, listening and as we're closing up, if you're uh, looking for some advice or where to get started today on something you think, well, gee, I can do something about that. Um, there will be an ECA account manager somewhere up and down the country that will be happy to assist in any way you can to help you identify resources and, and people that might be able to assist. And obviously, just a reminder that the webinar will be available on the ECA Business YouTube channel. So, uh, so yeah, on that note, guys, I think we'll close it off there. And if you've still got any questions, feel free to uh, fire them to me via email. So thank you very much for joining us today and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.